Welcome to this edition of Buncombe Life. Have you ever heard of the woolly adelgid? More specifically, the hemlock woolly adelgid. I have to say, I'd vaguely heard about it, but before we did this episode, I had no idea what a mean, pesky little bug that is. Do you have any hemlocks in your yard? Hmm. We're out here at the Botanical Gardens, and I'm looking, just right over there is a hemlock. They're everywhere. You may have seen some dead ones and wondered what happened to them. Well, if you have any idea you want to know, anything about that you want to know, anything, hang on, because we're going to tell you. It, it really is amazing. We're also going to explain the investment that your Buncombe County government has made in buying bugs to fight the woolly adelgids. Now, isn't that interesting? Stay tuned, because we're going to tell you more. I'm here with Margo Walston with the Hemlock Restoration Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, big, big name, big job. <laughs> and we're going to find out what's going on with that. Uh, first, but before we do, before you tell me what you're doing with the initiative, I want you to tell me, uh, because we're getting ready to hear the folks at home that are going to see a lot of information about a mean little bug. That's the right. woolly adelgid. The hemlock woolly adelgid. The hemlock mm -hmm. woolly adelgid. And I want you to tell me what, where in the world did this bug come from and why, why is it attacking our beautiful hemlock? Great. Well, so native eastern and Carolina hemlock trees mm -hmm. are both being decimated throughout the county and their range by this hemlock woolly adelgid. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a teeny tiny little sap sucking insect that comes from Japan. It he sap sucking. Sap sucking, Ew. yes. And that's what it does. It actually um, attaches itself to the base of the needle mm -hmm. and um, basically makes the tree starve. I think it's starving. Um, it, won't, it won't continue to be able to take in nutrients. Um, so it can kill this tiny little insect, which you can barely see with your mm -hmm. naked eyes, um, will take down an entire large tree in as little as three years. Which we're standing in front of a hemlock here. We are. We're standing in front of a nice, mature, healthy eastern hemlock tree. Um, this tree has been treated, um, so that's why it's looking so good. And that's but a key. That's a key. This tree's been treated. Right. Correct. If those little bugs that have come from where? The, so this particular hemlock woolly adelgid that has come to the eastern United States came from Japan. Mm -hmm. It um, was first identified on some nursery stock in Virginia mm -hmm. um, around 1951. It wasn't found um, in our area until the early 2000s. Wow. Um, and so people weren't really noticing the effects until mm -hmm. around 2004, 2005 mm -hmm. in this area. But it's affected trees up and down the Appalachian range. There have been many passionate and um, <laughs> concerned citizen groups that oh, have started yeah. their, own, their own grassroots groups to sort of spread the word, um, draw attention to the problem, mm -hmm. and uh, implement action on a local and a private level. Right. So, while there have been all of these great groups doing this important work, um, and many of these efforts to have long and short-term solutions have shown promise, mm -hmm. there's just not been a coordinated um, approach heretofore right. where there have been uh, a lack of, of, of funding sources available, lack of, of sustained public interest, and and coordination. So the Hemlock, the mission of the Hemlock Restoration Initiative mm -hmm. is to work with all of these existing partners and programs to develop a strategic plan and a coordinated mm -hmm. plan to help restore our hemlocks mm -hmm. um, in North Carolina mm -hmm. in our public and private lands. So our eastern hemlock trees are one of our tallest and our most shade tolerant trees mm -hmm. in our forests. Um, and they, therefore, because they're evergreen trees, they provide year-round sh shade for our streams and mm -hmm. habitat for over a hundred species of animals. Oh, wow. Um, they also are these 
beautiful m sort of stately trees that are unique in our forest systems. No other tree provides those same services, but they also are unique in our landscapes around our homes and around our commercial areas. So the loss of the hemlock is not only going to have a large impact on water quality mm -hmm. and on wildlife, mm -hmm. but it is also going to impact our plant nurseries, our individual homeowners and business owners and the tourism industry right. um, as a whole so it does this tree is, a, is an important tree to focus on and there's still a lot of potential left to work with it and right. um, see it survive right I guess what I'd like to share is um, just understanding that while everybody's really excited about beetles and weaning our trees off of chemicals that um, Beetles are not a practical solution right now for the individual landowner. Right. Um, landowners interested in biological control of the hemlock mm -hmm. lily adelgid need to understand all of the complexities and issues and limitations mm -hmm. that this approach uh, is faced with. And um, it's an experimental approach that we're dealing with on a, on a larger level, but there will eventually be mm -hmm. a beneficial impact um, every backyard tree is what we are hoping for. Every, everybody will eventually, with time and patience, be able to benefit from the predator, release, predator beetle release program we're doing here in Buncombe County. Right. If there's a landowner who is interested in taking the risk of being part of this experimental mm -hmm. um, program, or if there's anybody who wants mm -hmm. to help out with the uh, efforts of the initiative, on any level, mm -hmm. then I recommend that they contact me or mm -hmm. visit the HRI website for more information. That's perfect, and we will put that information on the screen so you can get involved if you want to volunteer or learn more about this project. But I'm just saying, stay tuned because there's more to come. Mm Uh, back in 2004 is when we first noted the, noted the Adelgid um, invasion and since then we've had mild winters and uh, relatively dry summers and uh, we're pretty much probably looking at about a 80% mortality now. The watershed I think is a good place for beetle release uh, mainly because of the size of the area, uh, the control um, and also the recapture, you know, provided the beetles do really well and uh, we uh, obtain a population that can be taken from and uh, relocated in other areas. No beetles have been released so far. We're currently, as of now, releasing uh, the first release and that is uh, approximately 160 beetles. Um, we have in our scouting um, expeditions prior to this have found actually uh, it's one of the same species of beetles that we're releasing today, which is a positive sign since no releases have been done in this immediate area. Uh, we chose this location um, basically because of um, the topography, the amount of trees, and the type of foliage that's left on the remaining trees in here. We have a lot of low-growing uh, trees that have needles that are close to the ground, and it looks like a good nursery for the release. The idea for the Beetle Project originated with Commissioner Brownie Newman, who came to Mountain True in January of 2015 and asked about what could be done for hemlocks. He thought that uh, protecting hemlocks and restoring hemlocks was a uh, bipartisan thing that the uh, commissioners could get behind and put a little bit of funding towards saving hemlocks in Buncombe County. So he talked with Bob Gale and I at Mountain True and we told him the options ranging from chemical treatment to beetle release to genetic research and Brownie really focused in on the, on the biological control through beetle releases. The goal of the project is to make hemlocks sustainable once again in Western North Carolina. They've been dying now for uh, the past decade because of a non-native insect pest, the hemlock willy adelgid. And this beetle from the Pacific Northwest, Laracobius nigrinus, can eat this uh, adelgid and could control their numbers enough to allow hemlocks to persist here. 
Western North Carolina is on the battle, front line battlegrounds of Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, and this technique is still somewhat experimental, though it has been used since 2006 here in Western North Carolina with some promising results. We now have a, a pretty large area where this Laracobius nigrinus beetle has become naturalized around uh, Linville, North Carolina, and it, it's expanding its range and seems to be helping hemlocks. Uh, w the results aren't final yet, but uh, it was promising enough that the county felt like it was worth it to try this. Sites were selected based on uh, their public benefit. So high priority sites on public land are the top priority for release. But people should realize that these beetles can fly. And by placing them on these high priority sites on public land, they will be able to s disperse for miles around Buncombe County and even surrounding counties. And will really help uh, eventually, hopefully, trees off of public land as well. It's important to save the hemlocks for several reasons, and I want to give you the first reason is there's no other tree that can exist under shade like hemlocks can. So back when we lost chestnuts, we had an oak tree that kind of partially filled that ecological niche. There is no tree that can fill the hemlocks role in the understory because they can exist in shade where no other trees can exist. Not only that, so that's number one. The second thing is they are God's greatest gift to the mountains in terms of air conditioning and clean water and trout and birds and deer. Um, wood thrushes only nest in hemlocks where I am. A hemlock is a keystone ecological species. And by keystone it means that the whole in ecosystem depends on that tree and builds out from there. I have, my undergrad degree is in integrated pest management. <clears throat> You're not going to be able to spray your way out of any pest problem. All the chemicals do is they buy time. And let me tell you, I really do thank all the arborists that have treated all the trees like Will Blozan and Lear Powell and uh, the Wildwood folks. But all that does is that buys us time. And the other thing I'll tell you is once you begin to treat too many times, you end up with all kinds of other pest outbreaks that I'll show you in the other room. You've got a long gain hemlock scale, spruce spider mite. And so what happens is those chemicals bought us enough time because we, didn't, we were ignorant and we needed to learn. And as soon as we learned enough to save these trees, we, I went to, for example, I went to Grandfather Golf and Country Club and they haven't put a drop of pesticide on their trees now in eight years. And their trees are gorgeous and they're covered with beetles, so it works. We're not guessing anymore. The chemicals can buy us time in a stopgap manner, but biologically the only thing that is going to save these trees on an area-wide basis are these beetles. We knew the adelgid was native to the Pacific Northwest, so I bought a plane ticket and went out there and in one week, I caught over 3,000 beetles, which is more beetles than a lab could produce in one year. So right away, we went from the cost of these beetles being 10 to $50 a piece because student slave labor rearing these things to being able to go out and catch them for somewhere between 3 and $10, you know what I mean. And the, the wild beetles are way healthier and they lay twice as many eggs, so they hit the needles running. We're trying to implement a long-term sustainable control for the adelgid. You know, nobody wants to be in the business of, of putting chemicals on hemlock trees for the rest of their life. So, you know, we started uh, 20 years ago trying to investigate, you know, what we could do as a long-term sustainable control for the adelgid. So we've looked at predatory insects, we've looked at, at insect pathogens, we're looking at, at all kinds of, and anything we can think of, you know, to introduce a, a check and balance into this system because we've introduced a pest without any of its natural checks and balances. So, you know, it, it's like the rabbits in, in Australia. You know, they've taken over because there's not a natural predator there. So we're, we're trying to insert some of those. And the one we're working with uh, predominantly right now is from uh, Pacific Northwest, so it's from North America, but it's Laracobius nigrinus. And we've been releasing it for uh, more than 15 years and got establishment in at least 75 or 80 percent of our sites. And uh, we hope that 
you know, that along with, uh, you know, some fluctuations in temperature and with, you know, some other predators that may or may not, you know, pan out that we're still studying that we can, you know, insert some checks and balances into this, this out of balance ecosystem now and, and maintain some hemlocks in the, in the environment and, and help maintain that niche that they create in perpetuity so we, we don't lose, you know, the bird species, we don't change the stream, stream attributes, we don't um, lose a key cornerstone species in the southern Appalachians especially. And I'm here with Bill Hasher with yeah. Biltmore. Uh, tell the folks at home what your title is, what you do here at Biltmore. I'm the arborist manager here at Biltmore State, and I'm in charge of all the arborist operations on the property. And I've been here at Biltmore for about 13 years, uh, just over 13 years now. Cool. And we, of course, in this segment are talking about um, the woolly adelgids, the hemlock woolly adelgids. I've gotten educated during this whole segment. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, but Bill Moore has been working with this, working with this problem now for a while. Tell me about that. Why did you tackle this problem? I know there's a lot of hemlocks here on yeah, this estate. Yeah, we, we started out um, when I, well, when I first got here back in around 2002. Um, I got here a little, little bit ahead of the Adelgid arriving at Biltmore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so being from the northeast uh, where, I, where I've come from is, uh, I was on the lookout for it. I knew what to look for and so when I started the job, I immediately started looking for this indelgate. It ended up, uh, we ended up finding it sometime around 02, 03 on the property. So you kind of knew that, that the indelgates were headed this way and well, knew well, to look for them. I, we knew they were here. There was a oh. uh, Forest Service bulletin that came out, I think, in around 1999 90, or 2001, mm -hmm. sometime around there, that uh, alerted property owners right. that the Adelgid has arrived. It is indeed in Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's here. So it was just a matter at that point of that point yeah. that it re got to a high enough level of infestation that we were able to notice it. Yeah. And then as soon as we we noticed it, we were able to start treating trees. And this was in around 2002, mm -hmm. 2003. Well, now when you say treating trees, what did you start doing? Well, the tools that we had at our disposal were injections into the soil with a uh, neonicotinoid mm -hmm. um, insecticide, mm -hmm. which the tree absorbs and, and it makes it poisonous to the bugs. Gotcha. So the stuff goes into the, into the foliage, mm -hmm. makes the, the trees poisonous to the bug, and with that method we were able to treat upwards of uh, 900 to 1,000 trees we, we were able to get treated and protected against the hemlock woolly adelgid. Mm -hmm. Now this, uh, this program, um, when it first started, we, we were treating the trees every two, three years mm -hmm. uh, in order to prevent reinfestation and the uh, avalanche of hemlock woolly adelgid when it hit our area was just incredible. Yeah. It, it was overwhelming to, you know, a lot of the hemlocks, any hemlock that wasn't treated quickly became infested and then within a matter of three to four years was was dead as wow. if you go around the forest if you go through some of our national forests where yeah. they, they weren't treated then yeah. you have so many trees and for the folks at home to realize and this is something I didn't know these hemlocks can be hundreds and hundreds of years old they've lived that long and these bugs can come in in a matter of years just a few years take them out and take them out yeah they That's just amazing. they they evolved without this pest, and then when this pest came in, they just didn't have any defense against it, and so it, it basically came in and ran, wa ran wild wow. and uh, pretty well decimated the hemlock population. Yeah, and that's just so sad because hemlocks are so beautiful, and in our area, it, we've had them here, and it's just terrible. So recently, in the past three years, really, I've, I've been hearing a lot of great things from the Forest Service, some mm -hmm. people that I respect in the, in the uh, mm -hmm. business who've been working on this with these predator beetles for decades have have mm -hmm. come around and said that they're seeing success mm -hmm. in areas that they've done re beetle releases right. and so that was very encouraging to me to get in and say how can we yeah. integrate this and start bringing in this biological control right. for our for our trees here at Biltmore mm -hmm. and what I uh, what I did was I contacted our 
friend uh, Dick McDonald mm -hmm. and asked if we, we, we how can I get some Beatles mm -hmm. he, I figured he'd be the guy to ask yeah he is, and he is so uh, yeah. so he was able to uh, back in um, this would have been October 15th 2013 uh, I had in my over first overnight shipment of <laughs> of uh, Laracobius migrinus beetles yeah. from Pacific Northwest that uh, I immediately came out and I released right right here right. Uh, with the hopes that uh, we would see some at least get our foot in the door with control right. and then being able to um, just introduce that population get the ball rolling mm -hmm. rather than being continuing to have to use chemicals over and, and over, over and over, and over again yeah. for the foreseeable future and yeah. for the you know for the rest of our time here. I yeah. mean, we got to we got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's where that's what drove the decision. Yeah. I was able to get the support from Biltmore yeah. to be able to do this, and uh, we uh, continue to have great support. And I cool. I really so I'm it's, glad. It's been two years. Two years. Have you seen any success? Are the Beatles taken? Are they taking care of some of these aphids? Have you seen any difference? Well, at this point, I'm guardedly, cautiously optimistic about right. this. Uh, like I said, it's something that we need to get, get our, just get this ball mm -hmm. rolling. And it, from my perspective, I think this could take decades for it to really right. start to show any kind of control. But um, that's that's something that I hold out. The, the trees that we introduced, the what we let the beetles go on. Yeah. They're still they they still look good. Yeah. Um, We've, we came in um, one year and two months after the original release, mm -hmm. and then we, we sampled for beetles, and we found, so mm -hmm. we found some, we found six beetles in about a half an hour. Oh, good. And so that encouraged me that it made it through that cold winter of 2013-14, yeah. and that they were still there, and they, all, yeah. they, they survived. Well, now, on the trees that you have to put the, the insecticide on, does that kill the beetles, or that just kills the aphids? It would kill the beetles as well. Okay. Um, but what you need to, um, what we need to do is make sure that we're releasing the beetles onto trees where they haven't have been had, treated. Gotcha. And so okay. we had, we have an area gotcha. here on property that to we have not. To see if that takes over, and then that can expand. And then as the, the chemical beetle. wears off in other areas, gotcha. while the beetle population is increasing, we might be able to see yeah. some of the. Uh, beetles going over to trees as they reinfest because if yeah. the tree reinfests that means that it's no longer poisonous to the bug right so that means that the chemicals are not in the which in the tree which yeah and so it's a it's a balancing act you have to decide okay well is it is it too much is yeah. it is it time to treat with chemicals again it depends on the location of the tree because right. we we definitely know that our chemical approach is it's a sure shot really it's a stop right. gap but it, it and it works at least it works you know something works and we but can then to get to find something that's not that chemical dependent and that's that's right. where we're at now is trying to find that we're in that period now where we are looking at transitioning and we're right. we're we're actively working on how right. to how to do that and along yeah. with you know yeah. a lot of great minds trying to work on this that's right. that it's exciting it's like the um uh the guy from the Forest Service that we talked to earlier uh, said, if you weren't doing anything, the trees would be gone. Mm. That's really a scary thing. Yeah, it's, it's sad. It is sad. It's sad. Well, it's exciting here at Biltmore, and y'all are always trying new things here to see what you can do and, and to get things working, and I hope, I hope it works for you. We'll check back Thank and you. see. Thank Thanks you. very much. Did I tell you? Was that not interesting? We've been everywhere. The watershed, Biltmore Estate. I'm telling you, it really is a group effort, a beautiful community group effort to fight these bugs and save our trees. But it really is worth it too. Carolina Hemlock, only found here. Definitely something to save. Something that we didn't tell you in the episode or we didn't get very specific about, and that is if I have a hemlock in my yard, what do I do just for that one, two, maybe three trees? We're going to put some information on at the end of the episode that will tell you more about that or check out buncombecounty.org for more information. And as always, stay tuned. You never know where we'll be next month.